Glory to God, family and friends. We got to stop pointing the finger everywhere else. You know, the world is all about the victim mentality and that's kind of seeping into the kingdom and we're doing the Satan made me do it syndrome. It's not me. It's Jezebel. It's Leviathan. It's he's they're the reason for all these things going wrong when we forget that we actually have a, a sinful fallen nature, that we are often our own stumbling block and our own worst enemies. When we blame everything and everyone else, even it's enemies fault, it's whatever's fault, it's, you know, faults everywhere. When we continue to blame everyone else, we are neglecting the very things that the Lord wants us to look at within ourselves, to repent for, to bring before him for healing, whether that's, you know, healing that you've been through and now it's causing you to act in ungodly ways or things like pride, you know, vanity, being conceited, vain ambitions, the love of money, all sorts of things. And the Lord's wanting to deal with these things. Like he wants you to submit before the end of this year. He wants this chapter closed. This is what I'm hearing. He wants many of these chapter closed because he wants to move up forward. But restoration is not going to come. The new can't come, not in the fullness of Christ that he wants to give it to many people. But until this iniquity is brought before him, he always deals with his people first. You know, there's a lot of pointed fingers. There's a lot of uh, people holding stones and we forget. We forget exactly what the Lord has forgiven us for. So let's start there. So I just have a few points I want to touch on. And, you know, hopefully one of these is you and you could just deal with it with the, let the Lord deal with you with it before the year's end, you know, I mean, we all should be walking upright, but I'm talking to people who are experiencing the manifestation of this hidden iniquity and it starts inside. It starts mentally, emotionally, and then it starts even, even in physical ailments and manifests, but then it starts to even manifest outwardly in the losing and breaking and all sorts of things around you. And again, we're quick to blame a, a demon, you know, that we have authority over. We're quick to blame Satan, who's not omnipresent. He's not everywhere at once. When sometimes it's just we're being our own stumbling block. So the first is those who are waiting on vengeance and justice. Now, this has been a word over and over and over because the Lord sees the hearts of men and because he loves you and he doesn't want you to continue being a stumbling block in your own life. And he's telling you to close the chapter, move on. Let go and let God. If you don't let go, you're not letting God do what he wants to do because you're using your free will to keep this chapter open, refusing to move on. And people have a lot of excuses. Oh, well, the Bible says justice and vengeance. Yeah, you know, that's telling you who your father is. Are you going to tell him when to bring that to pass? Are you going to tell him that I'm not going anywhere? I'm sitting right here until these things come to pass. Are you going to seek the Lord and let him comfort you? Let him actually allow you to forgive that person truly in your heart? Because what's happening here, let's look at the parable. Holy Spirit, put this on my heart for those that are, I'm not even going to say you're struggling to move on because I'm talking to people that aren't moving on. You're like just dead set on justice, justice, vengeance, whether or not you outwardly express it, the Lord hears it in your heart and it's coming, it's producing bitterness, lovelessness a host of all things that are unclean. He wants this chapter closed by the end of the year because it shouldn't take three weeks to really come into submission before the Lord. And for you people, he's giving the parable of the unforgiving debtor. Then Peter came to him and asked him, Lord, how often should I forgive someone who sins against me? Seven times? No, not seven times, Jesus replied, but 70 times seven. Therefore, the kingdom of heaven can be compared to a king who decided to bring his accounts up to date with servants who had borrowed money from him. In the process, one of his debtors who was brought in who owed him millions of dollars. He couldn't pay, so his master ordered that he be sold, along with his wife, his children, and everything he owned to pay the debt. But the man fell down before his master and begged him, please be patient with me and I will pay it all. Then his master was filled with pity for him and he released him and he forgave his debt. But when the man left the king, he went to a fellow servant who owed him a few thousand dollars. He grabbed him by the throat and demanded instant repayment. 
His fellow servant fell down before him and begged for a little more time. Be patient with me and I'll pay it, he pleaded. But his creditor wouldn't wait. He had the man arrested and put in prison until the debt could be paid in full. When some of the other servants saw this, they were very upset and they went to the king and told him everything that had happened. Then the king called in the man he had forgiven and said, you evil servant, I forgave you that tremendous debt because you pleaded with me. Shouldn't you have mercy on your fellow servant just as I had mercy on you? Then the angry king sent the man to prison to be tortured until he had paid his entire debt. That's what my heavenly father will do to you if you refuse to forgive your brothers and sisters from your heart. Man, he always has our number. And he's saying from your heart, not with your words, not even with your actions, from your heart. And if you truly forgive from your heart, you've closed that chapter and you've moved on because you know God's nature. You know, he is justice. Vengeance is his, but not on your time. And if you refuse to move forward in your heart, because you're waiting for this to come to pass, it's like somebody's wronged you and you want the vindication in the same chapter. And the Lord's saying, no, that's not what's going to happen here. Somebody wronged you. Close the book. Come to me. We're moving on. And he will bring vengeance to pass in his own time in a future chapter when you're not so dead set on it, because he's not going to give you what's going to bring you into a place of pride. And that's really what's happening here. And in this scenario, you are the one who's been greatly forgiven millions of dollars, and yet you won't truly forgive in your heart someone who's done less against you than you did against God himself, yet he was so merciful and forgave you. And he wants to teach you mercy. He wants you to have mercy for this person in your heart. And he wants it done by the end of the year. Because he doesn't want you going into this next season, into this next year. He doesn't want you taking one more step with this ugly stuff in your heart. It's heavy and you don't even see how it's manifesting into heaviness. It's manifesting into burden because the yoke and the burden of the Lord are light and easy. You don't even see how people can discern your bitterness. People can discern your lovelessness and your hate. You can't do this walk carrying your own baggage. It's not going to happen. It's not possible. And the Lord says, we're not going forward. And so you close this chapter and so you forgive, have mercy on that person. Like I had mercy on you. Brings to mind that verse, let he who is without sin cast the first stone. And there's a lot of people carrying stones when the Lord never tried to stone you, when the Lord never held stuff against you. You've got to understand what it means to be self-denial, to be on the narrow path. You are not entitled. You are not entitled. We are also not in the old covenant. You are not entitled. So you can't take scripture and use it for your own gain and say, well, God said it. You know, if you told somebody, yeah, I'm generous. Does that give the person the right to come to you and say, you said you were generous, so give to me right now. That's how we're treating the Lord, and we need to be mindful. This next piece is for those who are wrestling with something that's really real, but not everyone has experienced. I myself have, but it, it can't, I'm going to explain to you. Gang stalking and monitoring spirits and things like that. Okay, everyone on this walk is going to experience some sort of persecution, but some experience this. And I'm going to tell you, you will only encounter and experience gang stalking, monitoring spirits, and demonic gaslighting if you're in the wrong neck of town. You're in disobedience town. You have crossed over. You have gone into a place that you shouldn't have gone into because these unclean spirits, they are not like mobile spirits. They're not flying around watching you like people would have you say. This is more like you went to the wrong neck of town and you're in their neck of the woods now. And they're watching you because spiritually you're walking in disobedience. In some area of your life, you're walking in disobedience. You are because if you weren't, then you would have the hedge of protection around you that's stated in scripture. In Job, where... Say, excuse me, God says of Job that he's blameless and upright. He fears God and he turns from evil. That's how we're all supposed to be walking. And then Satan says to him, you have put a hedge. Have you not put a hedge around him and his house and all that he has on every side? And that's what the Lord does for us. He is our protector and he puts this hedge around us. Can't nothing see through that or get through that unless you open the hedge yourself. This is why warfare, when it comes to warfare, it's always about 
James 4, 7, submit to God, resist the enemy, and he will flee. Because you have to remember God's sovereign. So if he allows you to encounter warfare, he's either doing it because he's sifting you, you're going through testing, or he's doing it because you yourself have opened your hedge of protection up around yourself. Iniquity. You're in the wrong place spiritually. And I know this because, like I was saying, personally, I did this and I invited this into my life. And yeah, it was absolute hell. But you know what? Once you start walking in total obedience, again, here comes your hedge. These things fall by the wayside. They have no access to you. We are giving access to what's unclean. So if this is seemingly going on forever, if you're experiencing the effects of, the effects of this to the point where you're obsessed about it, or you're just greatly distressed, I want to tell you right now, there is iniquity that you need to repent for. And I encourage you to go before the Lord and repent because you want to be delivered. You want him to have mercy on you and he will. And he'll put his hedge of protection up around you because these unclean spirits, these are low level demons, low level demons that just watch and they take notes, but you're in their neck of the woods. They cannot get past the hedge. Okay. They can't get past the hedge. God won't allow it. They can't see what you're doing. You're protected. Even if they could see it, they couldn't understand it. Okay. Things of the spirit. Couldn't understand it. You are protected. So whatever iniquity that you've invited, that you've you've not even invited into your hedge, this is a, a, a situation where you've left your own hedge of protection. In some way or another, I'm talking about sin. You've invited it in some practice, in some type of iniquity. You're doing something the Lord's told you not to do. Whatever it is, you've invited this and you need to be delivered from it. You need to repent for it and go before the Lord. And you will find that he will close that hedge of protection. Gang stalking is not forever. Monitoring spirits, these are low-level demons that you have authority of, which brings us to the next point. If we continue to act like everything is spiritual warfare, it's really keeping us, it's giving us that victim mentality of the world. Everything's everyone else's fault. It's not. It's not, okay? You, first of all, you have authority, spiritual authority over Satan, over, you know, you have spiritual authority over Satan and demons. Now let's talk about Jezebel and Leviathan, which a lot of people like to talk about. First of all, do I, I don't actually believe, like I think somebody one day just had a sermon. They were like, oh, the spirit of Jezebel. Now everyone went crazy. Why do I say that? Because first, I don't believe that the spirit of this one wicked woman exists today. The Lord destroyed her horribly. You really think that she's just flying around doing whatever she wants now? Even if she was. She's not omnipresent. She's not everywhere at once. She's not all-knowing. She's not all-powerful. Not even Satan is omnipresent. So the way people act like, oh, it's Jezebel doing all this. We need to really be mindful of exactly what's going on here. Because we're letting these things in. We are putting the enemy above us and then saying, why do you torment me? You have spiritual authority over these things. If you truly decide to believe in Jezebel, okay, but you know what? What's more likely, because we sensationalize a lot of things. What's more likely is that Jezebel as a woman in the Bible was so wicked. She was, I mean, you can read entire, entire, you know, videos, even entire pieces about who she was as a person, as a woman. She was a murderess at the very least. She was wicked. She was dominating, a liar of, cur of course. She was curse. Yeah, right. All sorts of things. She was completely wickedness. Do a lot of people, men and women, take on these characteristics today? Yes. If we continue to point the finger and say, but it's Jezebel, that keeps us from repenting from this pride, from repenting from our own wickedness. That's making us act like this woman in the Bible. I truly think that someone just said one day, oh, yeah, Jezebel and everything. And now a whole bunch of people think they're afflicted. It's like the witch trials, the Salem witch trials. A whole bunch of people believe they're afflicted by something. And it's just like mass hysteria. Just repent. Repent for your iniquity. Because even if these unclean spirits were real, you have authority over them. Why are we talking about them? Why are we still talking about them? We need to start taking responsibility. And the Lord wants these things done by the end of the year because it shouldn't take anyone more than three weeks to submit to him, to truly go before him and say, Lord, help me to see, you know, search and clean my heart. Show me what's unpleasing to you that I can repent for what you want me to repent for. I often like to say, you know, I repent for sins known and unknown to me because we don't know everything. And if we're unwilling to go before the Lord and to repent, which is a gift, 
Repentance is a gift. It's not some shameful thing. You know, to go into your secret place and repent or to be like, Lord, you know, can you search and clean my heart and please teach me in ways that I can do better? That's all he's asking. But he's asking that this is done before the end of the year because he wants these chapters closed. These chapters of people exalting these demonic spirits, of blaming Satan for everything. While you're walking in disobedience and now you're opening the door to the enemy, you open that door to the enemy so he could come in and jack all your stuff up. And God allows it because your iniquity opened the door. And we're saying spiritual warfare. I rebuke you. Oh, Jezebel. And it's like, just stop walking in pride. Just stop being a dominating woman. Stop being a lying, thieving man. Whatever it is. We could say that there's a spirit of every rotten person that was in the Bible. Oh, it's the spirit of Goliath. He's always... Can we just bring this down to earth and be people that are not so over sensationalize everything sensationalizing so that we can just repent for our sin and be restored because that's what happens. Sin takes and sin now is manifesting for many people and a whole slew of things, you know, carrying heavy burdens mentally, you know, losses of things in life and heaviness of all sorts, spiritual, physical ailments, all sorts of things that we have opened the door to and we need to really go before the Lord and just let him deal with us and just really let him deal with us. You know, the last thing that I had on my heart to share was those who continue to look back, those who continue to look back and are wondering why the news not coming. The news not going to come until you close that door, close that door and do it by the end of the year in your heart, truly in your heart, because he hears all this. And if you continue to lie to yourself, you know, you're just holding back. You're blocking your own blessings when you do these things. And the Lord wants to close this, these chapters, all of these chapters. He wants them closed. The exaltation of demons, blaming demons for everything, spiritual warfare when it's our own sin that he wants to deal with. But the problem is we've forgotten. We've forgotten where we come from. We've forgotten who we're, we are at our core, who we really are when we refuse to let the spirit lead us and we walk by the flesh and then we have to come up with all these reasons why we're acting wicked. Oh, it's the devil. It's like, no, you're, you're walking after your flesh. You did what God told you not to do. And sometimes that is unknowingly, which is why we have to submit daily. And you breached your own hedge of protection. And we need to go before the Lord because this is going to, this, we can't let this continue. We can't let this continue to manifest in various different ways. I'm going to link a couple words below because um, because they're they just like have become relevant and it's uh, not I lied I rebuke that I didn't lie I just spoke I read the wrong page um, promises yes the two videos are promises to the unrepentant and the other video is two types of peace and one is talking about a false peace a false peace because. When you walk in wickedness, you know, you become like those people that wear masks. You justify things to yourself and you could find a peace in your own wickedness. Sure you can. It's not the peace of the Lord, but sure you can. And we don't, that's not the peace that we want. Leviticus 26 talks about the punishment for disobedience. Now you can say, well, I'm saved by the blood of Jesus Christ. I'm going to tell you right now. The blood of Jesus Christ is not here for you to keep on sinning. Okay. God is not going to protect you when you run away from him and continue to breach your own hedge of protection. God is like right here and you need to draw near to him and he'll draw near to you. But don't go into the enemy territory and say, God, where are you? Return to him. That's all throughout scripture. Return to him. Repent and he will restore you. He's done it for his people many times. Leviticus 26 talks about the punishment for disobedience. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, and mind you, these are his people. He's not talking. He deals with his house. He's not talking to strangers on the road. He's not talking to people that don't hate him, to people that he's talking to people that should know better. And that is us. But if you will not listen to me and carry out all these commands, and if you reject my decrees and abhor my laws and fail to carry out all my commands, and so violate my covenant, then I will do this to you. I will bring on you sudden terror, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. 
You will plant seed in vain and because your enemies will eat it. I will set my face against you so that you will be defeated by your enemies. Those who hate you will rule over you and you will flee even when no one's pursuing, pursuing you. I think it's a proverb that actually says the wicked run when no one's pursuing them. And I've seen this a lot too, where a lot of believers are, especially a lot of people who speak on these videos, are speaking from pure lovelessness. There's a lot of paranoia. People are paranoid. They're like demon hunting for the demons in everyone. And it's like, you know, the beam is so, so big in, in many people's eyes that they can't, that's it's skewing their vision. You know, the Bible says deal with the beam in your eye before looking at the speck in somebody else's. But people are just like, no, I can still see. Yeah, you're doing wrong over there. I see you doing wrong. And it's like, there's people out here being completely paranoid and acting from it. And people out here just justifying themselves of their own accord, walking in their own ways, making up their own revelation and understanding of the word of God. And that's not going to fly anymore. And he wants these things dealt with by the end of the year, because again, it shouldn't take more than three weeks to come into the presence of the Lord and to repent so that he can restore you. We're closing these chapters. Okay. We're closing these chapters. Things aren't going to come to pass our way. They're going to come to pass the Lord's way or not at all. Verse 18 says, if after this, you will not listen to me, I'll punish you for your sins seven times over. I'll break down your stubborn pride and make the sky above you like iron and the ground beneath you like bronze. Your strength will be spent in vain because your soil will not yield its crops, nor will the trees of your land yield their fruit. So he's actually saying that it's going to get worse. If you continue to let this go on, you're going to notice the actual manifestation of things getting worse and worse. You know, in the verse up here, um, verse 16, wasting diseases and fever that will destroy your sight and sap your strength. Anyone feeling just overtly tired? And so often we go to blame the enemy, spiritual attack. I've done it myself. But it's like, no, the Lord himself is like, who energizes you? Who energizes you? The spirit of the Lord, right? So if suddenly you're not energized, because he's the source, he doesn't run out of it. Suddenly you're just exhausted all the time. Come in the presence of the Lord. Come in the presence of the Lord and stop trying to get your strength back of your own accord. It's not going to happen. We are energized by him. We should always check in with him first instead of assuming it's everything and everyone else. The verse continues to, to get worse and worse in verse 21. You know, if you still don't repent, he's saying, because he's merciful. He's not being a, a rude here. He's not being like a jerk here. He's saying, I'm giving you this option. I'm telling you, come into my presence. Yes, you've received the blood of Jesus Christ, not as a reason to go doing whatever you want, not as a reason to go living in the way you want, right? The people in the word lived in the way. There's a way to live this life. And we need to live in that way because the Lord's called us to. And again, he wants us to do this by the end of the year, he wants these chapters closed. These doors finally close. It is time for the new. He's not a bad God because he wants to give you new, but you can't have it with all this old crap. You can't have it when you're pointing at people waiting for everyone to get their comeuppance. Like we, we really need to get our stuff together here. These burdens are too heavy. And in Matthew 11, 28, 30 says, come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I'll give you rest. Take my yoke upon you and learn of me. Learn of me, he says, for I am meek and lowly in heart. And he's telling you to learn that, to learn his meekness. Learn what it is to be lowly in heart and not full of pride and not full of your own prerogatives. And ye shall find rest unto your souls. This is how we're going to find rest. This is how we reconnect to the true vine. Because we pull our, we're ourselves off the vine and then we're just like, there's demons out here. Oh my gosh, I'm under spiritual attack. And, and he's like, come back to the vine. Let me restore you. For my yoke is easy and my burden is light. So let's come out of this victim mentality of, oh, it's the world. Oh, it's my enemies. Oh, not until God does this. No, forsake all of that. This is a part of walking your walk, self-denial. It's not about you. It's not about you. And if you really need something from him, then get into his presence. But stop trying to do things your own way. And stop using the word of God to justify why you can't love others. Because guess what? You, the servant, are not greater than your master, Jesus Christ. And nobody out there has hurt you more than he had suffered. And you might think that's trivial. Oh, okay. So it's Jesus. Okay. Are you greater than your master? Like we need to humble ourselves. You don't want God to humble you. The word says humble yourselves. 
And as we saw in Leviticus, if you don't humble yourselves and return to the Lord, and if you hear this and you're just, I'm fine, you should know immediately you need to humble yourself. Like me personally, even when somebody tells me something about myself, I don't want to hear. I'm going to take it to the Lord in case I'm wrong. I'm going to take it to the Lord like, Lord, this has been this has been said, you know, is this something we need to work on? You know, he's going to check you. He chastises those whom he loves. OK, you know, finally, in Isaiah chapter 40, we like to read this verse. It's a beautiful verse. And it says. Oh, it's so long. It says. But those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. They will soar on eagle wings like eagles. They will run and not grow weary. They will walk and not be faint. Those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. Why were they without strength? Because the Lord sapped it. Like it says in that verse in Leviticus. Because the Lord will allow you to feel the ramifications of the iniquity that you're walking. And you say, Kelly, that's a gross interpretation. I don't want to hear that. Well, when we scroll up to the beginning of 40 here, of Isaiah 40, you know where that beautiful verse began? In iniquity. In iniquity. Because God comforts and restores his people who formerly walked in iniquity. You know, I even, because uh, I was looking into this verse, you know, uh, for those who hope in the Lord will renew their strength. And people are like, oh, it's about hope. And the Lord is saying, you know, just keep, you know, whatever. It's about hope. It is about hope, but not in the way we understand it. Because in the beginning of Isaiah 40, the people are being comforted because they're coming out of sin. This is part of a restoration from having walked in iniquity. Comfort, comfort. My, I think a lot of people, before I just read this part, I think a lot of people don't want to admit that they're walking in sin because they think that God's going to punish you when that's a lie from hell. That's a lie from hell. Walking in the iniquity has the enemy in your ear too close. He's breached your hedge. The truth, the truth is repent and return to the Lord. Yes, even you who loves Jesus, even you who is a saved person can fall into sin. And many have the pride of their hearts, vel uh, selfish, vain ambition, the love of money, all the things I mentioned before, looking back, waiting for people to get their comeuppance, all these sorts of things, they're demonic. And he wants these dealt with by the end of the year because he wants to bring you into total restoration, exceedingly and abundantly above and beyond. So in closing, Isaiah 40 begins, comfort, comfort, my people, says your God. Speak tenderly to Jerusalem and proclaim to her that her hard service has been completed, that her sin has been paid for, that she has received from the Lord's hand double for all her sins. We never really look at a double portion like that. We certainly don't want to repent. And yet the Lord has all this stored up for so many people that they're walking in pride. They're walking in this weird place of vanity. And he wants this dealt with by the end of the year. Come into the Lord's present, ask at presence, ask him to search and clean your heart. Repent for the iniquity of if you've done any of these things, continually looking back like his cue, you know, waiting for people, for God to come against people, continuing to label people, continuing to be in places, situations, relationships where he's told you not to be. And now you're all surrounded by what's unclean and being gang stalked. Well, I promise you, you've invited that in your life somehow because I've, I've lived through that. And in true repentance, we become like Job, the hedge of protection all around us on all sides. Plus, incidentally, Job received the double portion. No coincidence there. In my trying not to make that super long, I negated this one piece where Isaiah chapter 40 is actually... You know, the reason the people were walking in sin, they were kind of like bound to it because they couldn't keep the law. And this is all about Jesus Christ coming. This is all about the Lord coming. And um, this is where we see a voice of one calling in the wilderness, prepare the way of the Lord, make straight in the desert a highway for our God, because they were preparing for the Lord to come. And the people were being told for those who hope in the Lord, you know, who are waiting for the coming of Messiah, you're believing in the prophecies, you will one day renew your strength. You will one day soar on wings like eagles. You will run and not grow weary and walk and not be faint. So how much more we who are of this generation who have Jesus Christ, how much more, you know, who have this free gift of grace, how much more do we need not to take it for granted by not walking in iniquity? We who actually have the Lord within us, some of you, how much more 
Do we need to be walking in the right ways of the Lord? Do we need to dedicate our time to him, submit ourselves before him, and not walk in the ways of the many ways that I mentioned formerly in this video? How much more the Lord has given you grace enough to do these things. He hasn't given you any situation where you have no way out. You know, like some of those of the community that are, there's entire communities of people who are being gang stalked. There's no way out. It's not true. It's not true. How much more do we need to turn from these iniquities? Let's finally close these doors and throw these keys away. Hallelujah. Because double portion, God's so good that he gives a double portion to Job who wasn't walking sinfully, but he allowed him to be sifted. Right? That's why warfare again, James 4, 7, we submit to God because we don't know why the enemy's coming at us. We resist the enemy and he will flee no matter what. Or in this situation, God gives a double portion to those who were just stuck in their sin, who couldn't get out of their sin, but they waited upon the Lord. And not only did they get a double portion, but again, they renewed their strength that had been sapped by the Lord. They soared on wings like eagles. They run and not grow weary. They walk and not be faint. And now the prophecy has come to pass. Jesus Christ is here. He's within us. How much more do we need to be people that are turning from all these iniquities, finally closing these doors, man, throw away that key.